Good to see all of you. Open your Bibles to Acts 15. Open in your material to page 12, which is Lesson 4. And for those who are visiting with us this morning, but you are not, um, if, you're, if you're just passing through and you're only going to be here today, I have some copies of today's lesson. If you would like that, would you please raise your hand and I can get a copy of that to you. Okay, there you go. Diane or Diana? Diana, okay. Hey, how are you guys this morning? That's for this morning. Good to see you. Good to see you. I'll give you two of them here. I got some extras. Thank you. All right. Okay, anybody else? All right. I got one left and I have one hand. So if you want more, you have to start paying me for them. Okay, let's start with a prayer. Holy God, we thank you for the morning. We're grateful for a night of rest, grateful for another day of life and health and blessing. And we're thankful we can be together this morning and we pray that you'll bless us in our study. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to start with a 50 question review exam. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But by now, you're, you're starting to think he might actually do that one day. We're not going to start with an exam, but I, I don't know if you can see this very well. Maybe, maybe you can. It looks a little clearer on, on the screen than it does back there in terms of the colors showing up. This is a map with Paul's first and second missionary journeys. We've already covered the first journey. And we are about to start this morning the second journey. Let's just retrace very quickly the visits that Paul made on the first journey. It started in what city? Antioch. Antioch. Okay. What city is the second journey going to start from? Antioch. And what about the third journey? Antioch. All right. All three of Paul's journeys start from Antioch in Syria right there. Now, Paul starts in Antioch, and who is with him on the first journey? Who's traveling with him? John Mark. All right. John Mark and Barnabas. Okay. So they leave from Antioch and they make their way down to the island of Cyprus. So we're following this blue line here. They go up to Perga in Pamphylia. Something significant happens in Perga. What is that? John Mark leaves them in Perga and he goes back to, uh, to Judea. All right, Barnabas and Paul continue on. They go to Antioch in Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, to Derbe. They stop in Derbe. Now, these cities that they visit, Derby, Iconium, Lystra, Antioch, they're all in the region of Galatia, all right? And we talked about the significance of that because Paul will soon write the letter to the churches of Galatia, and most likely he has these churches in mind, the churches that he and Barnabas established on that first journey. They stop in Derby, and then they turn around and retrace their steps. They go back through Lystra, Iconium, Antioch. Do you remember something that happened to Paul when he was in those cities that would make the fact that he retraces his steps pretty significant? What happened to him when he was in Lystra? Yeah. All right, he was stoned, nearly left for dead, okay? And uh, they stop in Derby, and he says, hey, let's just go right back to that city where they tried to kill me. That's a great idea, all right? So they go back, they revisit these cities where they establish these churches, and then from Antioch in Pisidia, they go down to Atalia, they get on a ship, and they go right back to Antioch, and that ends the first journey. Now, while they're in Antioch, there are some men who come from Jerusalem and they come up and they start teaching these Gentile Christians in Antioch. What, what are they telling them? You need to be circumcised. circumcised and then by extension, keep the entire law. All right, You need to keep the entire law of Moses. Paul and Barnabas vehemently oppose that. But they don't make any ground. They don't, they're not able to, to stop this influence that's coming from Jerusalem. After all, Jerusalem is where the apostles are. And if this teaching is coming from Jerusalem, surely it has the authority of the apostles. And so we need to be listening to these men. 
Barnabas and Paul oppose it, but they do so unsuccessfully, so they decide to go to Jerusalem to address the issue. And that's what we talked about, we often call the Jerusalem Conference, which we read about in Acts 15. And after all of the discussion about that, the apostles, the elders, they said, it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit to write down these essentials. And those were the things that they sent to the Gentile Christians in Antioch. But then, as we also saw in Acts 16 and verse 4, they distributed those decrees to other Gentile churches as well. Right before the Jerusalem conference, shortly before, not exactly sure how, how long, but shortly before the Jerusalem conference, Paul writes to the Galatians. And we said, in the letter to the Galatians, he doesn't refer to the Jerusalem conference. And the reason he doesn't do that is probably because it hasn't happened yet. Okay? So he writes the letter to the Galatians, then they have the Jerusalem conference, and that brings us to the end of Acts 15, where we start this morning. Look at verse 36. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaimed the word of God and see how they are. What is he referring to? The brethren in the cities we visited. The first journey. Yeah, the first journey. Okay, let's go back and let's revisit all of those same cities and let's see those churches and see how the brethren are doing. And this is where Barnabas and Paul have their separation and that was about John Mark. Uh, Barnabas wants to take Mark with them again like they did on the first journey. Paul does not. And we talked a little bit about that last week. We're not going to go over that again. They decide to separate. And there's an important lesson for us in that. It's okay for brethren to disagree on matters like this. As long as we don't become disagreeable with one another over matters like this. Did you notice it says in verse 39 that they had a sharp disagreement? I don't think this was just a, a matter where they were just very calm and, and collected the whole time. I get the in impression that they even maybe raised their voices a little bit and they were forceful with one another. But they decide to go their separate ways and they both continue doing effective work for the Lord. Barnabas and Mark decide to go down south to the island of Cyprus, which is where the first journey really got started. And Paul is going to take Silas, verse 40, and the church at Antioch is going to commission them as they go off on this second journey. In verse 41 it says, He was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So we start in Antioch. Paul and Silas start on the second journey in Antioch. And now we're following this purple line. They go up through northern Syria into this purple area, Cilicia, Tarsus, which was, by the way, Paul's hometown. And now they're going to start following this purple line through the second journey. You see, the first journey really was, although they traveled some distance, it was pretty localized. Now they're going to start moving further westward into Asia, Macedonia, and Achaia. And now Paul is really going to start carrying the gospel farther and farther into the stretches of the world. Now, chapter 16, verse 1. Paul also came to Derbe and to Lystra. And there was a disciple there whose name was Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek, and he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul meets Timothy in Lystra. Timothy has a good reputation in these cities. So Timothy is, um, he's a young man. We don't know exactly how old he is. A lot of people think he was probably in his 20s at the time Paul uh, comes into contact with him. And Paul is very impressed with him. And so in verse 3, Paul wanted Timothy to go with him. So Paul wants Timothy to go with them, and I don't want to say too much about this because uh, studying for this, it, it gave me a sermon idea, and if I let you know everything that I'm thinking now, you won't enjoy the sermon. So I'm not going to say everything I want to say about that. But Paul's impressed with Timothy. He wants him to join, uh, he and Silas. And now Paul decides to do something pretty strange for this young man who, although his mother was a Jew, his father was a Greek, and therefore Timothy had not been circumcised. Paul takes Timothy and he circumcises Timothy. Now look at the first question in your material. Don't you love it when the first question says in all caps and bold with an exclamation point, THINK! 
You know, I could have given you a softball question to start the lesson, right? What dilemma did Paul face regarding Timothy's circumcision? Consider what had just occurred in Acts 15 in answering. I don't know that dilemma is the right word, but Paul has some things to consider when he determines it best to circumcise Timothy. So what do you think Paul has to wrestle with a little bit in line of Acts 15? All right. In Acts 15, we've just established that circumcision is not a requirement. And then when you turn the page in the book of Acts, Paul's having somebody circumcised. And it's, it's Paul, are you, are you talking out of both sides of your mouth here? Well, no. Why does he do this? Why does he have Timothy circumcised if circumcision, according to Acts 15, is not a requirement for salvation? Come all things to all men. Okay, explain what you mean by that, Ronnie. First Corinthians chapter 9, he discusses that beginning part about verse 18, 19, somewhere along yeah. in there. He talks about it from the standpoint that he, where he could, I guess, uh, use the word compromise, where he could compromise and fit in. He did so, and not to in order not to raise an undue difficulty in trying to get people to accept the gospel. Okay. Since circumcision was a matter of choice or a matter of... It didn't make any difference. He, he went ahead and practiced it. Okay. I, I was reminded, Glenn, did you do any research on your question a couple of weeks ago? That's what I was fixing. <laughs> uh, one thing about Timothy, why did he go ahead and do it anyway? I know it's for that, but isn't that still trying to show that it was necessary? Okay, let, let's keep the discussion, and then we'll come back to that. Okay. Calvin? It was expedient. There was no pressure. There was no one trying to force this upon Paul or Timothy at this point. Paul knew what he was going to be attempting to do, as Ronnie said, in trying to teach the gospel. And it was, it was within his, what he considered his Christian liberty. Right. And it was expedient for him to do this. Go to Galatians chapter 2. There were people that had come in and spied out their liberty, as the scripture said, mm -hmm. in regards to Silas. And they resisted that. He did not have Silas circumcised at that point because there was people there were people there, there were those there that were trying to force that issue. That's okay. All right. About. Charles. I actually think uh, the level is a good word. Because oh good. This, Charles agrees with me. <laughs> this is a pretty difficult thing to uh, we're going to see that in Galatians 5 where it says if you are justified by the law, you may death to do the whole law. And yet again, he puts circumcision on Timothy. We understand why. But it seems at the surface level very contradictory to me. Yeah, okay. Ryan, make it quick. We need to keep moving. Okay, just as far as why he would do it with Timothy specifically, it says Timothy's mother was a Jew and his father was a Greek. And you know, it'd be one thing if Paul was trying to do to a Gentile, getting a Gentile circumcised, but the Jews would know that Timothy was a was a fake Jew, you know? Yeah. <laughs> right. So how does that happen? even less than a Gentile? All right. Okay. All right, let's let let's think about this. Where, or, or as Paul and Silas and Timothy travel together, who are they going to be preaching to? Jews first. Jews first. They're going to go to synagogues and start there. And they're going to reach the Jews. Paul knows that everybody knows that Timothy is not a, 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 a true Jew. All right? At least everybody in his geographic area. They know Timothy's parents. Okay? They know that his father's a Greek, and they know that families typically follow the custom of the father and not the mother. So they know Timothy's parents. So Paul says, all right, if we're going to be going and preaching to Jews, Timothy, they're not going to listen to you if you're a Gentile. They will listen to you if you receive circumcision, not in order to be saved, not in order to find your salvation through circumcision and submitting to the, to the law of Moses. But this is just simply, Timothy, you, you are giving a concession to these people because they won't give you a hearing for the gospel otherwise. Okay? You with me? All right. No? I'm getting some looks like, I don't know about that. <clears throat> yeah? All right. Glenn? I still want to know how they need <laughs> Do more research. All right. I mean, they're making a point out of going ahead and doing this. 
Uh, yeah, o okay. Preach, I mean, you know. Well, Jeff Stone made an observation a couple of weeks ago, and that was that, you know, this was not a society that is as independent and individual as ours is. Um, this was a society that was much more open, and you'd go down to the bathhouses, and you'd walk around without any clothes on, and, and people just knew, okay? And Jeff's right about that. Now, should were Christians doing that? I don't think so. I think Christians would have stopped if that's what they were doing when they were pagans. Um, but there is something to that. This was a much more open society, okay? A little bit different than our circumstances now. Okay, Wayne. I can't hear what everybody's saying, but I just wanted to comment that Paul was also known for not putting uh, a great importance on some things. He made the statement that he became all things that's so that some men might be saved. Right. He didn't think this was a big deal. Yeah, yeah. And they're doing this so their, their influence in preaching can spread. All right, let's move on. Now, look at question number two. Uh, what important work were they doing according to Acts 16 and verse 4? We've mentioned this already. Just call it out. What are they doing? All right. Yeah, they're distributing these decrees from the letter in Acts 15. Uh, they didn't have a Xerox machine where they ran off copies of the letter that they wrote in, in Jerusalem. They're probably just distributing these decrees orally. Okay, this is what we did in Jerusalem. Here are the four things that we determined that needed to be kept. Now, look at Acts chapter 16 and look at verse 6. They passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. All right? Now, if, if you look, well, let's keep reading, and then I'll come back to that. Look at verse 7. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, or Mysia, they came down to Troas. When he says they did not preach in Asia, and you follow the path that they travel, they go through these regions, and they get to Antioch and Pisidia, and then it says that they were forbidden to speak in Asia. Now, basically what that means is, you look at these cities down here, Laodicea, Sardis, Pergamum, Smyrna, Ephesus, those are the Asian cities, the larger cities in Asia. They didn't go to any of those cities on this time. So they go on the north side, and then they come up this way, and they want to go up here into Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit says, no, you're not going to go up there either. And so they go around Asia, and they go over here to the city of Troas. Okay, now we're going to come back to Troas uh, in our third journey, but something important happens in Troas. Look at question number three. Who joined Paul and his company in the city of Troas, according to chapter 16 and verse 10? Lydia. Not yet. Luke. Luke. All right. Look at verse 9. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Paul, Silas, Timothy, they're over here in Troas. Paul has a vision. There's a man from over here in Macedonia saying, We need help over here. Come to Macedonia. Now in verse 10. When he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. We decided to go to Macedonia. God called us. And who's writing the book of Acts? All right. Luke is a doctor. We know from Colossians chapter 4, most likely he has his practice in the city of Troas. A little bit of speculation in that. But most likely, Luke is a resident of Troas. He's a Christian. Paul, Silas, Timothy come to Troas. Paul has this vision and Luke joins their company and he's going to travel with them for a little while. As you read through the book of Acts, look for these kinds of pronouns, these plural pronouns, we and us, that include Luke and the company. All right, Luke is very clear when he is and is not traveling with Paul. You just have to follow those pronouns. You can't speed read the Bible, okay? You can't speed read the book of Acts. You got to look for these, these instances where Luke is with them and when he's not. So they're going to go over to Mass Macedonia. The, the major city, the first major city in Macedonia that they come to is the city of Philippi. Now, I know we're probably pretty familiar with the events of Acts 16, and so we're not going to just analyze every verse of that chapter, but there are two people who are converted in the city of Philippi that Luke discusses in Acts 16. There were probably others, but there are two people that Luke highlights. Who were those people? The first one was Lydia, okay, and where is she from? 
Thyatira. Thyatira, all right? Thyatira. She is not, she doesn't live in Macedonia, and incidentally, Thyatira is not up here on the map. Uh, but Lydia is not from Philippi, but she's there for business, all right? She's a seller of purple. She's there in that city working. Philippi is a huge city, okay? It makes sense that Paul and the company would go to Philippi. They're not going out to rural areas uh, where, you know, the, out in the, the villages and the mud huts where there's only 10 people, all right? They're going to metropolitan areas where there are thousands and thousands of people. That's where, you, you go where the people are. And so that's what they've done. So they go to Philippi. They meet Lydia as well as some other women who had gathered together for prayer. And they they have some success in preaching uh, to, to Lydia. Look at chapter 16 and in verse uh, 15, when she and her household had been baptized. So I said, you know, that Luke mentions two people specifically, but Lydia's household is also baptized. And maybe that includes um, uh, a husband if she's married. I, we don't know that she is or is not. Maybe, maybe children or servants or whomever may be with her. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So she's converted. She turns around and she shows hospitality to Paul and to his company. And then, beginning at verse 16 through the rest of the chapter, we have a, a long story about the Philippian jailer and his conversion. Uh, let's just quickly summarize the story. In verse 16, Paul says that there was a slave girl who had a spirit of divination who met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. And following after Paul and us, she kept crying out saying, these men are bond servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. This poor little girl is possessed by this spirit, but she's going around and she's saying, these men are servants of the Most High God. She's saying good things, right? Yeah, but what are the people who know this girl, who live in that area, who know about her affliction, what are they thinking? <laughs> The demons are performing. The, all right. So, okay, we know this girl has problems, okay? And so they, she's probably not helping Paul and his company as much as she thinks she might be. Um, it, we studied in Mark. It's not uncommon for the demons who possess people to recognize who Jesus is. You know, the demons said that. To, we know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. And Jesus would say, shut up. Be quiet. I don't, I don't need the testimony of Satan, okay? Um, it's not that what they were saying was wrong, but coming from a demonic spirit, that's eh, not really the testimony that you want. Now, this girl is going around with this demon, and she is saying these things about Paul and his company, and it says in verse 18, she was doing this for uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, no, many days. She was doing this for many days. You think Paul got tired of it? We know he did. Paul was greatly annoyed, verse 18 said. And he turned and he said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. And then Paul ruffles feathers. Because this poor little girl, she's a servant. She's a slave girl who is a possession to her masters. And they're using her. It says they were making a great profit from her by her fortune telling. Um, makes me wonder if it was legitimate fortune telling or not. I tend to think not, but these men are running this business and using this poor little girl who has this demon. And now that she doesn't have the demon, well, they've lost their golden goose, okay? And they're upset about this. And so they, verse 19, they drag Paul and Silas into the marketplace before the authorities. And they say in verse 20, these men are throwing our city into confusion and are proclaiming customs which it is not lawful for us to accept or to observe being Romans. They're going to be thrown into prison after the city is in an uproar and they're very upset about this. And in verse 24, the jailer, having received the command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. 
All right? Where's Timothy right now? We don't know. They're there in Philippi, but for some reason this was targeted at Paul and Silas. Luke and Timothy escape this persecution. Good, good observation. Okay, Glenn. Before we get past the slave girl, mm -hmm. from what it says, does that mean that Satan and the demons can see outside of time just like God can as far as predicting the future of what's going to happen to them. Well, and that's why I made the comment, I don't know that this was a legitimate kind of fortune telling. Uh, was it true or was it just... A lot of money, then at least some of the predictions had to come true or she wouldn't be trusted. I don't know. I mean, a lot of people can make money in illegitimate ways. People today do that. Yeah, read them by their actions. I mean, Miss Cleo, you know, she can, or I don't even know if she's still around. But generic. I remember, it, yeah, yeah. Them saved. Yeah. I see in the future one day Alabama will win the national title. Well, <laughs> anybody could have made that prediction, right? So I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not sure what to make of this exactly. Um, I, I don't believe, though, that, that Satan has the same... Um, no, I'm not talking about the same, but a okay. amount of it. Okay. Because he knows what's going to end up. Right. I, I don't know. I can't, I can't address that. I haven't studied that enough to know. All right. Now, Paul and Silas are thrown into prison. Luke and Timothy are somewhere, but somehow they escaped this, this persecution. Okay, Mel? I was going to make a point in verse 21. All right. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans. That being Romans does not apply to Paul, although he's Roman. It applies to those people. And they lay it on like, you know, we're Roman citizens. And they're, they're using that as a law to try to shut him down. Okay. That, that's why I'm saying it. A lot of times when we read that, some people think that that being Romans was they're speaking of Paul. It wasn't Paul being Romans. It yeah, it's the people in the city. Living here under Roman rule. Right. We're Romans and this is not lawful. Yes, yes. Philippi was a Roman city. Yeah, good, good observation. All right, so Paul and Silas are thrown into prison. At midnight, we see in verse 25, what are they doing? Singing. Praying and singing hymns. What would you be doing? Praying. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Mommy! <That's laughs> yeah, Paul and Silas, you know, they, they're accepting this. This is persecution. Hey, Paul's, hey, I've been here before. I've nearly been stoned to death. This is not a new thing for me. And so they are taking this in the proper spirit. Um, uh, they're singing, they're praying, and somebody's listening. Who is it? The jailer. Yeah. Miraculously, an earthquake happens. And the jailer thinks, oh no, everybody's escaped. And so what does he do? Whoosh, he draws his sword out. And what's he going to do? He's going to kill himself. Why? Because if you are a Roman soldier and you let a single one of your captives escape, you're dead. And not only has one escaped, he thinks the whole prison has gotten out. Paul says, do yourself no harm. We're all here. You don't need to kill yourself. You haven't lost anybody. Now, the jailer comes in and he says in verse 30, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Interesting question. What prompted him to say that? His listening. His listening, the singing, the praying that Paul and Silas are doing. Typically, the first question that a jailer would ask under these circumstances is, why are you all still here? Yeah. Right? I mean, your shackles have been released. The doors are wide open. Why are you still here? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Here's a man who is in within inches of taking his own life. And it forces him to ask some pretty important questions. And so he takes Paul and Silas, it says in verse 33, that very hour of the night he washed their wounds. I think that's a sign of his repentance. And immediately the jailer and his household were baptized. And now for the rest of chapter 16, I'm just going to skip over mainly for time. Um, but they are, Paul and Silas are going to be released. And in verse 40, they went out of the prison and they entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Lydia opens up her home again, shows hospitality to these men who are now um, ex-convicts, and she welcomes them into her home. Paul and Silas meet with the brethren who are there, also there in Lydia's house, and then they are going to get out of the city of Philippi. When you think about Philippi, think about Lydia, think about the jailer, all right? Those are the two people that Luke highlights. There are more, their households, both of their households, but Lydia and the jailer. And later on, 
when Paul's in prison in Rome, many years from now, we'll get there eventually, but Paul's going to write a letter to the church at Philippi. And when he does, who's in the audience listening? Lydia and the jailer. Okay? All right. Now, Acts 17. When they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. Look at question number four. Who stayed in Philippi to work with this new church? Luke. Did you notice in verse 1 it says, Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis. Luke's not with them anymore. So Luke joins Paul and Silas and Timothy here in Troas. They go over. Next stop is Philippi. They establish a church. But Paul and Silas are going to leave Philippi and Luke is going to stay there and become their local preacher. Okay? And he's going to stay there and work with this new church and help them. We'll come back and we'll find Luke a little bit later in the story. Uh, but Luke is going to stay there in Philippi. So, Paul, uh, Paul and Silas go to Thessalonica and it says in verse 2 that for three Sabbaths, which means that Paul was in Thessalonica for at least two weeks and three Sabbaths, possibly three Sabbaths and three weeks. Did I fade there? Uh, I'm back. Okay. So Paul's going to be in Thessalonica for three weeks, or two, two or three weeks, but three Sabbaths, we know. And when he's there, he goes into the synagogue of the Jews and he starts reasoning with them from the Scripture. Now, how much success does he have? Mixed results. Okay. Look at verse 4. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. But, verse 5, the Jews that is the Jews who did not believe Paul's preaching, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar, and attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. Jason is one of the people who was converted by Paul. And these Jews who did not believe, they are seeking to persecute Paul and Silas and they know that Jason welcomed them into his house. So they go to Jason's house, beat on the door, give us Paul and Silas. But they can't find Paul and Silas. It says in verse 7 that these men of the city said, Jason has welcomed them. That is Paul and Silas. Jason took them into his house. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. Hey, yes, sir. Back in verse 6, much of this says these people have made trouble everywhere and in the world. Yes. Which is... You know, I'm just trying to head around the fact that, you know, from Antioch, almost where Turkey is now, to where they are, to try to move that type of information is pretty incredible. It's like wildfire, right? I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable that where we are in Macedonia now, they're aware of how the effect of the world is having. Yeah. What these two couple men are doing. Yeah, good observation. Really, I don't know if you heard what Jack said, but he said it's amazing that the word has spread about what these guys, Paul and Silas, are doing. Um, they're preaching the gospel, people are being converted, and the word is just spreading like wildfire. It's hard to believe that just these few guys, as these men said in verse 6, man, they've turned the whole world upside down. And uh, that's exactly right. That's what they did. They were preaching a radical message, and they were changing the world every city that they went to. So these Jews, these unbelieving Jews... They start to try to persecute Paul and Silas. They're unable to get their hands on Paul and Silas. And so in verse 6, they drag Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities. If we can't persecute Paul and Silas, we're going to persecute these people who became believers in what Paul and Silas were preaching. Now, Paul and Silas escape. Verse 10. The brethren, in Thessalonica that is, immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. 
So they're going to leave Thessalonica, all right? They go Philippi, Amphipolis, Apollonia, over to Thessalonica, which is right over here. They face that persecution there. They escape. They go down to Berea. When they get to Berea, they go into the synagogue, and that was their custom. Let's go find people that we have common heritage with, Jewish people that we can relate to, and let's start there. Those are God-fearing people. Let's start there before we go to the pagans who don't know God. Now, when they go to Berea, verse 11, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. Let me make sure we understand who is being discussed here. The Jews in Berea were more noble-minded than the Jews in Thessalonica. This is not talking generally about everybody in Berea. The Jews in Berea were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. The ones in Thessalonica didn't give Paul and Silas a hearing and tried to run them out of town. But the ones in Berea, they accept what Paul is preaching. And they did that because they were examining, verse 11, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And therefore many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. But, here comes trouble, verse 13. When the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And we're going to stop there. This lesson stops there. Let me make one observation here that I, I, wasn't, I didn't think I was going to have time for. Paul leaves Philippi and he goes to Thessalonica. Now turn over to Philippians chapter 4. Now again... We're, we're moving ahead chronologically here. Paul has, is not writing Philippians at this time. Okay, It's going to be a, several more years before he writes to the Philippians. But when he does write to the Philippians, look at chapter 4 and verse 15, which incidentally we're going to look at this verse in our uh, sermon this morning too, but look at verse 15. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, he's referring to this second missionary journey, this first time he came to Philippi, when he says, at the first preaching of the gospel. He leaves Philippi and he goes down to Thessalonica. Look at verse 16 now. Even in Thessalonica you sent a gift more than once for my needs. So Paul leaves Philippi, he goes to Thessalonica, and the church at Philippi at least two times in the three weeks, two to three weeks Paul is in Thessalonica, they sent money to him to help him and support him in preaching. All right? Okay. Thank you for your comments and your, your study.